Okay. Welcome to another weekly Terrarium dev stream, team stream, hangout stream, uh, whatever you want to call it. I'm your usual host, Wayne, uh, one of the game designers and team lead on Terrarium. And uh, you, if you haven't tuned in before, every week I hang out, I play some levels that uh, have been submitted by our community, and we usually have a different thing that we're doing. Uh, last week we announced the uh, the long list of finalists in our level design contest, which was pretty exciting, and we played a bunch of those levels. Um, and this week we have a guest with us. Uh, this is Natalie Walshots, who did a lot of the writing for Terrarium. She wrote uh, she wrote the story that the game is going to be launching with. She helped do a lot of the world building and character development. And uh, she's also a big part of the uh, social team that is handling what what goes out on our social channels and, and uh, how we present ourselves to the world. So I'm going to let Natalie introduce herself now while I load up a level and start doing some playing. Hi, Sounds Natalie. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Wayne. Um, hello, I'm Natalie. Uh, I have, uh, I came on board um, working on Terrarium, uh, oh man, back in um, 2018, uh, so in the in the ancient past now, um, I wrote, uh, I got to write a lot on this and in a lot of different forms and um, all of it was an incredibly positive experience and also uh, a hell of a lot of fun. Um, so I wrote uh, a lot of the story, um, like Wayne said, I did a lot of the development, especially when it came to um, the personality and backstory of the gardener and the Mugu and, um, you know, just sort of the filling, filling out the world a little bit. Um, I wrote all of the uh, item descriptions. So all of the descriptions of all the every, every rock, every plant that tries to murder you has a, has a lovingly crafted artisanal uh, description that goes with it. Uh, that was a spectacular amount of fun. Um, yeah, and not be, uh, it's not to be no, understated either. Uh, <laughs> you wrote a lot there, more of those than are currently in the game because one thing I did, yeah, I wrote, I wrote like, I think like hundreds of them. <laughs> yeah. We have a lot for future use. Um, oh my God. So many. Uh, and every everyone lo as lovingly crafted. Um, every time the game yells at you for losing or grudgingly congratulates you, I probably um, wrote that snarky bit of text. Like this, this, for example, better hide the evidence. Hide the evidence. <laughs> uh, every every kind of like weird little bit um, of text that pops up on the screen, including the um, the uh, loading screens, yeah, so like the descriptions of the, say thick mugu. Let's um, let's take a minute to appreciate this one. <laughs> do, you want to, uh, do you want to read this for the people <laughs> sure uh these stubborn hardy little mushrooms are tougher than they look they have evolved in their gravity light environment to be oddly heavy letting them anchor themselves more easily to the ground and navigate difficult terrain strong winds and powerful storms don't rattle these obstinate fungi their tissue is super dense and they do a surprising amount of damage when lobbed at an obstacle so these were so much fun to write we Oh my god, so had much these, fun. You know, we've had Mugu have been sort of like a central thing that we've been designing around since the beginning. And mm -hmm. Natalie was instrumental in like the personalities of these these different Mugu types that we wanted to emerge. You know, we knew they were a swarm and there weren't we didn't want to think of individual Mugu as like you have a name and you have a you have a name. It's more of like each type of Mugu is this collective consciousness of the swarm but we could give types personality. And um, once we knew- They what, almost have like the little hive minds. Yeah, once we knew what we, what they were doing in the game, uh, Natalie helped say like, okay, so like what is the personality of the thick Mugu, for example? And um, you know, it, from there we just went crazy with it. It is a lot of fun. Uh, my favorite of these, <laughs> that hopefully comes up later, is the gooey Mugu one. That says, oh, I think it starts you. off yeah. by saying, like, the most unfortunate of Mugu types. <laughs> <laughs> the most unfortunate Mugu type. Yeah, the, uh, they're, a, a, a neat thing 
uh, about um, like coming on board this project uh, when I did. Um, oh, uh, Mr. Jones is asking if uh, if one of us has notifications on. I don't know if I do, but I will turn make sure that all of mine are turned off. Thank you for letting us know. Um, like a, a cool thing that uh, that often happens in like this is a video game writing and thing in general I think not necessarily just a, a terrarium thing, um, but we already knew basically say like what the gooey mugu or the um, thick mugu or we knew what they were going to do, you know like we knew uh, the and that that was I think something that um, you were kind of involved in uh, more than me, Wayne, and also earlier than I was, is figuring out what all the different Mugu types um, were and what their abilities were. So sort of coming into it, like, I would be given, like, okay, this these are the properties of this object. Like, this is what it does. This is how fragile it is or how invulnerable it is. And, when you know, when it came to the Mugu, like, this is the particular... Um, like skills or weaknesses or whatever of like this uh, Mugu type. Um, so I there was kind of that that kernel of data to start with, and then you know figuring out what the personality of the thing that could do that thing um, is really quite a bit of quite a bit of fun, uh, and also like uh, is a very interesting sort of constraint. I don't know if you if you find that or or if you've um, you know sort of uh, experienced that in the work that you've done, Wayne. But you you know kind of get um, uh, you get handed a lot of things because like the work is so constantly collaborative um, that you're you're sort of uh, having um, you know you're 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 often being handed something something that um, someone else has. Uh, you know, already like locked down or knows part of, and you're, you kind of have to like build on or build within that constraint. Yeah, definitely. Um, sorry, I was getting distracted by the level trying to figure out how to get past this juncture. Um, <laughs> no, some no, of these are hard. There was They're a really lot, hard. There was, I think that that really shows in the asset listing. <clears throat> it's, I mean, it shows in everything, but you mentioned, I think you wrote like 200 individual asset descriptions uh probably about a hundred a hundred of which are in maker mode right now um right i don't know how many users have noticed but anytime you place something in maker mode when you select it uh, here let's go take a look at one there's ui that appears on the bottom right of the screen um mm -hmm. which if the asset has variables that you can change mm -hmm. appear there but also uh this is where we see those item descriptions so uh, for example that's not a good example even just like these rocks podium rock <laughs> daddy rock <laughs> for example <laughs> let's look at daddy well, I rock thought it looked kind of like a podium well this is the daddy rock look <laughs> the daddy rock is playing horsey with a baby rock isn't that the cutest <laughs> thing <laughs> you know we just had all of these assets and some of them have a function and we'll look at some of those where you you wrote something relevant to like what this item does um mm -hmm, absolutely which is fun it's like, but oh, other it's, ones were just like this okay shoots fire so i'm going to talk about its fire shooting abilities but in this case it's a rock <laughs> yeah it's like here's 40 rocks and natalie had to be like uh <laughs> what does this rock say to me uh so here's daddy rock for example let's look at something uh on one of these monsters like what's a fun one I mean, oh man these are so much fun we, we love mega cabbage surprisingly oh, mega for its cabbage. size this attack cabbage delivers devastating crush injuries to all of its path. <laughs> her eyebrows is her best feature uh so yeah these these just add so much to the world um all three heads of the tri trap function independently giving it more opportunities to catch prey but it all goes to the same stomach. Like, I don't know. I It takes... <laughs> people see all this stuff. This adds so much to the game and so much to the world building. And that there's like there's not very much there. But the volume at which you did these and the ability to get handed hundreds of them and have to think about writing something relevant that fits the, fits the theme of the game and, and is like, you know 
cute but kind of funny. I think you were the one who invented the term agorable, which is <laughs> something that we say about the game that is like one of the game's mantras, right? Is it's like mm-hmm. adorable gore. It's supp- it's supposed to be mm-hmm. horrible and about murder and terrifying things that are like also kind of cute and funny. And like also, right? I would argue very cute. And there's there yeah that that tension between like. Um, everything being like just like pinchably adorable and also horrifying at the same time is is I think like uh, a huge part of what makes this game like wonderful and uh, like that kind of tension between like I am both uncomfortable at, with what I am doing and also find it endlessly hilarious. Yeah. Um, I see we're getting a, a question about what the cabbage's name is. Uh, unofficially, uh, <laughs> the cabbage is named Frida. <laughs> Uh, in in honor of her her majestic unibrow. Here comes the reveal. <laughs> Let's turn her around <laughs> on stream. <laughs> dun dun dun. Ah uh, yes. Let's see how close they are. Yeah, the uh, the, the flower on uh, the flower on Frida um, comes from uh, before before she was uh, designated a, a mega cabbage. I think there was um, uh, part of her history was was a as a more of a, a cactus like creature so there was sort of like a she's like a round cactus with like a little cactus blossom on her on her head um i mean she Jeff technically obviously, is she's got uh, little little thorns and things uh yeah 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 so the little like yeah see the little uh her little like spikes but yeah. she, o- over time she became uh more of a more of an attack cabbage um than a than a uh attack cactus but the you know her her little spines and her um her flower remain as the like heritage of of her origin she's a great example of just the what emerged out of the collaboration of the different parts of the team because Mm -hmm. one of the first like monster characters that i designed it's called a cabbage well we call it a cabbage because it's a relic of, of me being like I want a giant gnarly cabbage that rules after you like, Mm -hmm. like the big rock from Indiana Jones. That was the starting point, you know? And then I, and then I wrote up a design, a short design document for that. And, Mm -hmm. um, the devs built a ball that chased after you when it saw you. And, uh, the art team started trying to be like, okay, well, what would this look like? And it went from a cabbage to this cactus thing and Pac-Man was referenced and somewhere along the line, it got this eyebrow and the rest (laughs) is history. That's all Jeff, I think. Yeah. So, um, it was fun, you know, and then now it's just one of our most beloved art assets. Absolutely. I, you said something interesting, which is, you know, you would sort of like announce what you wanted you know, as a as like one of the um, kind of like core uh, like producers and designers of the game, like you'd say, like I want something that does this. Like I think there needs to be like a monster that does this, or like a, an obstacle that does this. Like I, we we want them, and sometimes it was fairly simple in the like I want there to be lava sense. It's like okay, there's lava, um, but sometimes very complicated when it comes to like the monsters right it's like i think we need a monster that like rolls after you like an indiana jones rock um that's very specific but then like somehow we got to frida the mega cabbage (laughs) from monster that chases after you like indiana jones rock um and like that process i think is is super interesting and part of it is just like there's a million hilarious geniuses like you know collaborating to make that happen um but also it, it kind of starts from that like game design i want this um thing uh, and that was something I, I wanted to talk uh with you a little bit about I, I um when we were talking about doing the stream i know i mentioned it um the, i find like the form of video game writing really interesting and unlike anything else um and uh you know you've referenced the game design the the game design document and sometimes you know we've we've referred to it as like the the story bible or something like that um and i i I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about like a what that document is and looks like um and also like what your uh kind of experience 
writing it was like or sort of what uh, you know the work that you did on it and how that because it was quite different from the like the work that I did on Terrarium and I'm still doing on Terrarium <coughs> where you know like you know you you and it's a difference between like you saying I want an Indiana Jones cabbage and me writing the description of that Indiana Jones cabbage are you know there's like a there's a there are many steps in between those things. So uh, yeah, I'd yeah. love if you could talk about the game design document just a little bit. Sure. And and sure. game design documents in general, like how they work. So there's sort of two sides to this that you you reference both of them in your very long question that you just asked me. <laughs> <laughs> My like eight part question that uh, I just asked. <laughs> one of them was story bible. And one of them mm -hmm. was game design document. And they share a very similar space. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it's worth pointing out at the start of my answer that both of these things, I'm going to be talking about it from my perspective, but mm -hmm. I mean, by no means was I, I wasn't the only one who did th these. Um, right. You know, I had, we talk always about how great our team is and uh, all of the different stages this game has been through and people who've come and gone from the team and things like that. It's very much, it's, it's, wouldn't be possible without a lot of collaboration from a lot of different people. Um, but now, for my actual answer, I am great, and I definitely did it all myself. Um, <laughs> so let's talk about that. <laughs> I So Story Bible, um, they both start in different places and start to converge the more you know about your game. At least that has been my experience and a part of... Of, of my process in designing the games uh, that I've worked on, which is you start with what do, what do we want this game to be like and what are some of the core values and things that we want to explore and then you start designing gameplay qualities that get at those things and that's sort of one thing and we've talked about that on stream before, you know um, early, early versions of the game were called Tiny Apocalypse and it was about mm -hmm killing cute things and it was about a whole bunch of stuff going wrong at once and it was about um you know adorable gore like colorful mm -hmm. blood splatter and, and stuff that was like blood but not really blood and and all of these types of things and so we start designing little game experiments that are like funneling slowly towards a type of gameplay and a, and a mm -hmm. type of um the type of experience that begins to reveal itself as it goes like it's just there's no other way to do that than exploring like what what's fun what's not and that's from everything down from like um in terms of what feels good to control how does that combine with you know the little um individual elements that you're creating and how they interact together so that's one thing and that's more the game design thing and mm -hmm. as we do that the game design document just requires a lot of a lot of writing and a lot of refining and a, and and it's a very ongoing process in the early stages to um, highlight how your game works and and not only that but like what what it is and what it isn't. Um, so that was a long process in the development of this game in the very early stages. Um, so that's sort of one thing, but eventually you get to the point where you have like your core, the core parts of your game design document around which you can make a pretty good prototype that let you explore those core qualities <clears throat> and the core moments that you want to create. So we had that pretty early on. And for us, that was like, what are Mugu and what do they do? How do they behave? Um, how do they move? How do, they, how do their little Mugu brains think? Um, what are the things that they can do how does the gardener control them? How does she move? What can she do or not do? Um, mm. And then what are some basic things about the world that then allow the Mugu to interact within that world? Because, you know, we knew this was a game about Mugu doing things to stuff. So <laughs> we're like, you know, there's going to be breakable items. You know, we knew we would have rocks that you could throw heavy Mugu at. We knew we wanted Mugu to get, like, knocked around and blown around. I mean, you know, every game has fire. We knew there was going to be fire, so you need stuff that can burn. So we, this list of, like, qualities and this matrix of how they interact 
emerges through that process of testing out and trying all of those different things. And at the same right. time, the your control scheme emerges. When they're described, um, don't necessarily like work in the universe of the game. Yeah, exactly. You know, like I, there were there was tons of stuff that we thought was like it sounds amazing on paper and super like it sounds like an incredible idea, but as soon as you start programming it, you know, it it doesn't work within the rest of the ecosystem that we've created, or yeah. you know, it it causes a technical problem that like is going to take way too much time and energy and space to overcome or, or you, you know, just like... try and do way too much. Like, yeah, uh, absolutely. Adam, Adam and I, uh, my game design partner, I think, I think designed like 12 or 14 types of Mugu originally. And I mean, this was before, yeah, there were so before many. we made any, but right. You know, your mind goes to all those spaces, which is like, what are all the things they can do? And we're like, Oh, electric Mugu that turn on switches and open gates and um, just all like every dumb idea we could think of we sort of designed a Mugu for and started thinking of things they could do you know there were like <laughs> one that I don't think ever came close to being made was like tasty Mugu which would, like, <laughs> dance and lure enemies towards them uh, there's a design document for that somewhere but, I remember uh, that. I remember there being Tasty Mugu. I, I also remember just like, I think it was just a a, a a bit of brainstorming that's like, what could a possible Mugu be? And I had like dozens of just bullet points. Um, and like, I think one of them was like, this Mugu just has a cool hat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was like one of Evan's suggestions. It was a just Mugu like, the only thing this Mugu has is a hat. This is so, quite yeah, a good hat. So that, that's very much like, you funnel right you think of everything yeah. and then you funnel down to the ones that work the best and then you mm -hmm. funnel even further down to like what can we actually create and uh you know i won't get into too much but at one point we got down to like these are the eight we're gonna make and um mm -hmm. still biting off way more than we can chew we ended up with four uh the game has three right, right now you might see a fourth by release um mm -hmm. i've been told not to promise anything but uh, so that's sort of the game design side, right? Is is and is is throwing out good ideas and saving them for some other project or for later because um, you need to be realistic about like what's actually going to be healthy for the game and healthy mm -hmm. in terms of like an achievable scope. Um, right. So that and also just like we want it out in the world, like on the most on the most basic level, like we all want this game to be released. We want it to exist and be working and doing well and look excellent. And exactly. you know, the, the more like the more stuff is in it, like every one of those things is like you have to kind of weigh that against like is this valuable enough to you know, make sure that it goes in before it gets done, because done is super important and kind of has to be the like end goal. Yeah. <clears throat> then on, on the story Bible side, that kind of mm -hmm. happens in parallel. And eventually the two things converge as you go. You, uh, I'm a, you can't see me. I'm converging with my hands. They grow, <laughs> they grow closer and closer together uh, through the the game development process until they smash into each other and become the same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's both wonderful and beautiful because you're like, look, we, we planned all these things and, it, and they work together so perfectly, but also disastrous because certain things you're like, wait, this doesn't make any sense or this won't work. But uh, I mean, on that side, we started from the same place as what, what kind of game do we want to make? What would be fun? Mm -hmm. In the same way that that started all of our game design conversations and, and led all of our early um, development experiments on what can we do with Mugu before they were even called Mugu, before they were even mushrooms. The the common themes there were like you know, mitigating chaos, mm -hmm. big things going wrong very bigly all at once, uh, <laughs> little cute things dying horribly and it being funny. Um, so like we start from the same place there and mm -hmm. early versions of this game were like the very, very first game jam we did with some of those early ideas. Uh, they were 
bacteria in a petri dish. Um, yeah, I, I remember seeing those very early on. Yeah, and that's like very beginning. So I don't think we intended that that's what it would be, but for that game jam, that was what we got. Um, right. From there, there was started... an earlier build of the game too. I remember um, where there were, I think, two types of mugu. Who, they might not have been called mugu at the time. They were definitely mushrooms, though. Uh, and you would incinerate them horribly in order to create like a, a bridge or a raft. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we talked about them as like little Vikings at one point, which was like you were <laughs> a god, and the Vikings want to die to get into Valhalla, but you need to f- right. you need to funnel that passion into getting them to achieve things so they die in the right way. Right. Um, so just making a bridge for you. <laughs> so we we were designing and writing around that for a while, and mm-hmm. then at a certain point we decided this would be a maker game because we wanted to make something where people could design their own levels and make fun things mm-hmm. and, and use the assets we were going to use to make the game themselves. And something there just clicked and it became about gardening. Um and I don't remember the exact moment, but it was just, I don't know. Maybe I was very into making terrariums at the time. I'm not sure. I'm a gardener, but I don't know if it came from me specifically, but it became about gardening, and then it became about alien gardening, and it became mm-hmm. about sentient mushrooms. Uh, prob- I uh, it's lost to time. I don't know. Probably Jeff, our art director, was doing all kinds of sketches about like what our characters could be like and things like that. And it it just emerged when out I... of that same collaborative process we were sort of uh, talking about in terms of uh, Frida that you still see on the screen there. So mm-hmm. um, it emerged from that. And then the two worlds collided and we ended up where we are now with like a gardening alien grandmother and sentient mushrooms that you smash and kill against things and plants that try to eat them. Mm-hmm. I remember when I when I first came on the project, the gardener wasn't uh, the gardener yet. Like we, we weren't sure who or what the gardener was going to be. Um, and you know the, the, the title the gardener emerged before the character did. Um, we we're trying to figure out like what kind of like, weird alien creature like would have this title and uh and uh jeff i think uh our director started uh sketching these like weird progressively weird little old ladies um or creatures that like could be interpreted as little old ladies um and then what you know sort of emerged from that i think you and i started started talking pretty seriously about like okay but what if she's like an extremely ambitious like space grandma like a little bit mad scientist but mostly just like a super vindictive old lady um and i think it was you who as soon as um as soon as you came up with the name of her rival being dolores like everything kind of opened up for me in terms of like i knew exactly who she was like i knew exactly the kind of like motivation but you know personal ambition and spite that was fueling her like i could i could see everything and kind of this like um like i knew exactly what she wanted and it was so petty and it was absolutely worth destroying worlds for and uh and getting to that like getting to that place with her was like a super fun journey so and i think it's I, I do think it's really credit is due yeah. i'm pretty sure it was adam who came up with Dolores. oh it was adam okay i'm okay. not exactly sure but I, I also Dolores. specifically remember evan talking a lot about like mm. uh what's her name like she's got to be like sweet and sour like he referenced like betty white a lot like yeah sweet and sassy kind of like uh, deceptively spry and things like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember working through early design concepts with Jeff of like, you're right, the name Gardener came long before the character and we were mm-hmm. talking about like some more adventuring type alien things, like these like gelatinous characters with like capes and bags that they were going to be pulling, you know, roots and reagents and things out of and yeah. um, at a certain point Again, I don't know who, where it started. Maybe it was Jeff, but it it just came from, like, 
if this is a game about gardening, who gardens? And, like, what kind of character can we make that isn't really... That's going to be just different. And I think it... it may, maybe it was Jeff, and he just started drawing old, old granny-type ladies. Mm-hmm. And uh, I definitely remember seeing that and being like, that's the one. Do more of that. We need yeah. to work on that. And I remember being like, put her in rubber boots and gloves. <laughs> Give her big glasses. Like gar- classic gardening gloves. Ex- she needs a cane yeah. to get around with. Let's ex- Perfect. Let's explore that. And pretty quickly, mm-hmm. everyone on the team just fell in love with the idea. And it was like, yeah, yeah. it's a game where you play as like an old lady. Um, <laughs> which is something that felt, it felt like a, a connective tissue, I think, to everyone on the team. Mm-hmm. Almost yeah, absolutely. immediately, and we really rallied around that, and and that fed into the feedback loop of like, this is going to determine more of like the humor style and the art style and the writing style and things like that. Um, absolutely. And it also became something that was like we we've shown this a few places. We were at the um, Indiecade showcase at E three last year, which was really mm-hmm. special, um, showing an early version of the early access there. And uh, she's definitely divisive. Like, a lot of... It's almost like mm-hmm. 50-50. It's like, you know, like the toilet paper roll argument. Uh, in or out, right? I'm an out guy. Right, over, overhand or put, underhand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but people would either be like, oh my god, she's great, I love this. Like, this is cool. And then you'd get some people who are just like, I don't want to play as a grandma. We're like, why'd you make it a grandma? And we listen, would just, listen, we would just play, every other yeah, game has exactly. a bald space marine. If you want to like, play as a bald space marine, yeah. there are eight billion other games for you. You're in the wrong section. But it's a good way to easily <laughs> weed out like how much enthusiasm we needed to put forward towards that person. Just because mm-hmm. like the second someone says that, you're like, okay, this game isn't for you. But the second, yeah, you know, yeah. If you're if you're gonna have a if if you can't see the wonder of our of our alien space grandma, this is this. You know, I don't know if spending a lot of time with cute destructible mushrooms is really yeah. <laughs> is really the space you want to be in. Like we, uh, we, there was we actually um, had a few grandmothers. There were like ladies oh, yeah. there with their grandchildren who came up and were just like, "This is the only video game I've ever seen." Where with like. Yeah. A, someone yeah like, you know not like me but like with someone i can relate to and that's cool i don't know that felt cool that Especially. did feel cool and i i think i think it's very cool like i think uh there are there are not enough like grandmas who get to be like video game lead characters like she's a pretty she's a pretty unconventional <laughs> like leading lady the gardener's um, brother is a bald space marine he's called the yeah. grenadier <laughs> i've just i've decided his name is the grenadier uh just in this in this particular moment um one of the first pieces of feedback that we ever got about the game like this was so many iterations ago um like like two years ago spring we released like a pre-alpha like a like a very 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 early version of the game um, to a very limited group of people. Um, you know, you had to like sign up for uh, for the pre-release and wait. And you know, we very very carefully like selected for like early early community feedback. Very very exclusive, incredibly like exclusive. like so small so small. <laughs> uh, and, I th- and I think we got like yeah, we're very fancy. Um, and we- we had uh, we sent out a survey afterward, and in the first six responses, like I'm not sure where in there, but in the the first six responses we ever got to the game, somebody said like, "Can you please design more outfits for the gardener?" So like, you know, as you progress through the levels right and get better, you can like earn cute little outfits and like, you know, have her have her like look different. And, uh, and then we never, did. and it was just like, you understand this, you know what I mean? It's like, I, I don't know if this probably, this is not a thing we can ever deliver for you, but the fact that you look at this like weird little alien grandma creature with antlers and are like, I would like more outfits for this cool little gardening old lady. Like some, something has gone spectacularly right here. 
So we, we knew we so nailed we, we it knew when we, we found, her. found her. Yeah. Uh, when we stream when with we Jeff, stream, yeah. I should try and get some of the designs up. I think it'd be mm -hmm. really, really cool just to like flick through some of the old character art and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I yeah, have absolutely. something on screen that I've wanted to talk about for like 30 minutes, which mm -hmm. is uh, to get back to the asset writing and stuff that you were doing. Oh, yeah, sure. I only saw these like a month ago. I did not know that you <laughs> did this. <laughs> you put these Easter eggs in. Here's here's the Zedite. These tiny <laughs> pink crystals show up. Oh, it's this one over here. Sorry. Yeah, these yeah. tiny crink pink crystals show up after lava flows appearing on igneous rock like blossoms named after a middling writer <laughs> <could that be? laughs> so, <laughs> yes yeah, so i definitely named this rock after myself uh and there are lots of rocks particularly the crystal rocks that are named uh after various team members and i just i just uh just plopped this in the game and never told yeah, anyone. Why make a video game if you're not going to put esoteric Easter eggs in there? Absolutely. Here's like Kelvinite, little, little, named yeah. after uh, Kelvin, our 3D artist. Mm -hmm. These crystals are often seeded in other rock and slowly push their way outward until they can't be contained in the rock splits. Named after a generous polymath. <laughs> so yeah, these are, I don't know, these are cool. Did, I just thought you would appreciate knowing that I found your Easter egg. You found them, ah. That for some reason I didn't know about until like a month ago. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Very cool. I'm, I'm, Very I'm cool. glad that you like them. They are every every crystal uh, that I got to name is is in some way named after a uh, a team member, which is really fun. And yeah, like what it what is what is the point in doing this weird work if you can't like you know give give tiny little like writing gifts to your friends <laughs> in the form of like crystal descriptions exactly so let's let's pick the that question from half an hour ago back up with you which is sure. um because at a certain point you know all of the writing like i you know me and some of the others established a lot of the early stuff, which is like, mm -hmm. here's some of the general things we know. Here's what we think mm -hmm. the story is about. Here's, you know, character descriptions at the level that we're at. And then things kind of mm -hmm. got handed to you, which was like, mm -hmm. um, I know we had very different plans at one point for how the story was, would emerge. A mm -hmm. lot of the descriptions that we were just looking at in maker mode before we knew we were really going to lean into the maker mode side of things were like, you would have a little field notes menu where when you encountered things in a level, you could sample them and collect the the note about that item. So that's where those things originally were going to go. And you were writing them mm -hmm. for that. Um, right. So there was that. We got You got tasked with, you know, write the story um, mm -hmm. that is people are going to be seeing in the, in the, in the game uh, in about two months, I think. This yeah, summer, that, sometime, was, sometime, that was a lot of fun. Sometime this summer, like we haven't settled on a, on a date yet. There's still things moving mm -hmm. around, but like it, this summer, the game is releasing, and it has you know a short but sweet little story in it that kind of tells the the story of the gardener and the mugu. So I don't want to spoil anything, but like, can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about getting handed, you know, the beginnings of the story bible and an early game design documents and what your process was for like how do you wade into that and start to assemble a, a personality and identity for the game from that that's uh that is a great question and i realize i've, I've set myself up to have to answer this <laughs> this <laughs> extremely uh convoluted and difficult one by asking it myself but um it's like i'm not sure there's an exact science to it is the thing like i'm i'm not um i've done it this is not the first and only time i've done it um like i do i do other contract work and i often get like handed other people's projects and you know um told to like uh write all the boss dialogue that could possibly happen in any of these boss fights and you know, it's it's someone else's creative vision. It's somebody else's universe. It's you know, there's there's a there's a ton of kind of like 
constraint that's already been designed, um, and I have to somehow like figure out what this character who already exists, who somebody has like a very very clear idea in their head, like what they would say. Um, and there's not exactly a like like a a very scientific or like technical way to do that. Like a lot of it is very um, a lot of it's very not in, instinctual, but um, you know you. A lot of it, it's it's a very imaginative process, and it's it's a you know it certainly takes a lot of iteration. Like the the story that we ended up with um, for the gardener, like when it comes to literally like what the actual narrative of the game is, has both changed so much, and in a lot of ways, like not at all. You know, sort of once we knew who she was and what she wanted, like she is this ambitious little old lady who wants to win the intergalactic garden, horticultural societies gardening competition more than anything in the known universe and she's willing to do anything to do that um, that core idea like once you know we sort of collectively knew what it was um, that hasn't really changed you know that's that still is at the is at the heart of the story um, but how you how we get there and what exactly like the um, the plot beats are and the actions that you have to take and you know how it um, intersects with the gameplay uh, has changed frequently and often like pretty dramatically. So um, it's kind of a weird thing where like on one hand I've always kind of known what the story is, but on the other, um, you know, I uh, I feel like I and and you and a bunch of other people <laughs> have in fact written it a whole bunch of different times for like different iterations of the game. So kind of every time that the, uh, every time the game has changed in, in terms of, you know, and whether that means the gameplay or the exact assets that are in the game or e even just the way that it's being put together, um, that writing has had to change and has often had to be like, um, you know, redone or reconfigured. So, you know, the field notes, uh, like you said, became the item descriptions. So all those, you know, all those ideas um, exist, still exist, but they're just in a in a very, very different form. Um, you know, when we were uh, at the point where the game sort of switched from like a more traditional puzzle game campaign to a maker mode oriented game, um, there was this sort of sense of like, okay, how do we tell the story we know we want to tell now within a very different structure? So we, we still know we want to tell that story, but how do we do so, um, you know, in in a different set of constraints? Like uh, a thing that a thing that has changed, um, I think, relatively recently in in kind of the um, in the game's history, I guess, is that. Uh, the, um, it used to be a lot easier to breed Mugu, and they were sort of constantly <coughs> breeding out of control. You know that they were, uh, you know they were they were di they were dying a lot, but see, uh, but they were also like constantly reproducing, um, and and you'd have this like ever increasingly huge swarm that was really terrible for frame rate. I might add, <laughs> just yeah. like would off, all, often like completely destroy your ability to like move around or do anything. Um, We've talked about that, that a lot on previous streams. I'll play that. I'll play that version on stream someday. People you can, totally should because it's, it's, it's just like it's like a it's like fleas just re reproducing out of control, just like bouncing all over the place. Um, but they uh, like that the story that kind of like comes out of. Um, you know, even that, like, one mechanical change, like, means the way that the gardener interacts with the Mugu and treats them, like, is a little bit different, right? When they're, like, you do have to kind of keep some of them alive some of the time is a different, um, you know, different, like, both gameplay mechanic and, and, and narrative concern than, like, uh, you know, the, they're endlessly expendable. That's like, true. Things being endlessly you know, and being endlessly expendable are, are just mean different things than you know, like okay, I have I have to keep ten of them, or what 
whatever, you know, like I have to, it's a, it's a much um, more, like I have to be careful about this resource as opposed to like, I kind of need to kill as many of these as possible to keep the game yeah. playable. Yeah, I used to find myself even. like, oh God, I got to kill some of these. And you'd be looking <laughs> yeah. for ways to kill them where they couldn't, where they couldn't breed, um, mm -hmm. which was very hard to design a game around, a stable game <laughs> around. But yeah. it was, you know, it was fun. Uh, part of me regrets that we never like cracked that, but I think the game is much healthier where it ended up now, which is like just much. Yeah, it, I, I totally agree. It's hel it's healthier and and it's, it's like not just more playable, but like it, now that we're leaning just into more like we, it's about people making their own levels. It, it's yeah. so much easier to for someone to get their head around what the Mugu mm -hmm. are and what they do and how they can be used than before where they were just this like uh, unchecked force of nature that was like <laughs> <laughs> just like replicating constantly out of control well uh, yeah. and like I think that comes you know gets to something we've been I think talking around a lot which is like you ha there no idea or character or thing or mechanic is sacred right like yeah. On one hand, you kind of, you of course need to know like what your game is about and what it's doing, but like think like for the longest time we thought like the Mugu breeding constantly and out of control is an absolute necessity of this game, you know, it 100% like is a core thing, um, but in the end it wasn't, and in the end it was something that had to change, and I think that that like that's really important, especially with the kind of like collaborative work that this is is that like you have to be willing to at least question <laughs> ah very good uh attack cabbage yeah they, attack that was cabbage. your indiana jones moment <laughs> very good but you but, like you have to be willing to just like give up almost anything right that that you know or at least question like is this thing that i'm holding as like an absolute necessity or something that like 100% must be in this game no matter what, um, does it really have to be there? And does taking it out, in fact, leave us with something that might be better? Yeah, and that's the uh, hardest part about like creatively steering something. Um, yeah. It's like every time that happens, it feels like you're just like, gutting your baby and uh but it's healthy and it's necessary mm -hmm. uh nobody gets it right the first time i mean you know no. i'm sure even, some even people like... do but mo almost everybody <laughs> doesn't and yeah. uh it's it's one of the hardest lessons to learn is mm -hmm. when when to gut it and when to change directions in the right ways mm -hmm. um but you know Again, that comes out of a lot of testing, a lot of collaborating with the right people, a lot of like, you know, doing your best to check egos at the door and things like that when you're working on yeah. something like this. Because, um, it, yeah, it's drastically different than what it was, and it's drastically different from from, you know, what it was the second time. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there have been so many. Um like definitely more than two or three like complete rebuildings of this game and i think that that's um like that's been absolutely crucial to getting it to where it is now um and i you know i think it, it looks better and it plays better than it ever has um even though there were like other versions that i certainly got like very attached to or thought were beautiful or that like you know i totally loved or had like you know very particular like oh this you know this seems perfect or this having this mechanic makes <laughs> makes this narrative uh work really well or work so much better um that uh you know that like i can't i kind of can't imagine um a world without it and like a, a huge part of this creative process is reimagining the world without everything um and a, a a nice part of you know we don't have infinite resources to do this but a really nice part of um of you know game design as a creative process is you can try things right like you can like okay let's take this out and see what happens 
or let's put this in and see what happens. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't, like, we can take it out again. You know, you can, that, that different builds that do different things are possible um, in yeah. a way that's, you know, that you can kind of, like, actually play the thing and see if it works and, like, make that judgment you know, based on like, is this still fun? Is this still playable? Is this more fun? Is this more playable? Um, and what what is it kind of what is it kind of doing there? Um, yeah, and figuring out how to do that at the right time. Yeah. You know, the, the most important thing you said there is that like, resources aren't unlimited. Um, no, for sure. Talk to a lot of like, you know, young aspiring game designers and level designers and things like that. Uh, especially in our release stream and people were asking us a lot of like specific questions they they thought would help them and stuff and uh, you know, one of my pieces of advice at the time was like everything just takes time and or money and you know yep. for a company where everyone needs to make a salary to pay the bills it's just money and money buys time um mm -hmm. and for a lot of a lot of young people um you can sometimes just get by on your time and your passion you know uh, so i always encourage them to like before you before you get weighed down by the responsibilities of the world like channel that into something with your friends like get you mm -hmm. know get together with your friends from school and, and make little projects that that uh, you think are fun while, while you can afford to do it that way. Um, yeah. Now, I don't want to sound defeatist with that, but when you look at like... No, 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 not, not at all. Like, obviously we've made like a really incredible thing with like a lot of constraints to time and money. Like a lot of constraints to time and money, but like here it is and it's it's like really incredible and people can make really incredible things with it, right? Like that there's this, this level genera generating engine that we have built. And I think that that's... You know that that's really um, that's really cool and that's really extraordinary and it means that you know we um, like it's 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 something that's uh, constantly living and evolving because you know players are going to make things that uh, all the time that we could not possibly have foreseen and that like you know the great thing about kind of this you know letting other people design levels is you know they can do stuff that we wouldn't have thought of. You know that that there's that there's that kind of like um you know you're sort of uh giving away creative control and in doing so opening up so many more possibilities yeah it was a way for uh, us to make our work yeah go further definitely yeah uh we have a yeah. question when story writing about a group or item how do you give just enough detail to add mystery, but not too little where people feel it's lazy writing? I'll let the writer answer this one. The professional <laughs> writer. That's a great, this is a great <laughs> question. Uh, like, a, like, you always want to leave enough space for someone else's brain to fill it in. Right? Like, and this is, this is true in any form of writing. It's not just, not just for video games. But um, there's sort of this like tension between your um, audience's imagination and what you're giving them. So, um, like anytime it's when it, when it's like uh, like literal words either on a screen or on paper, um, and you're trying to make someone imagine a thing, like I am never going to be able to pull the thing directly out of my head, show you exactly what it looks like to me, and have you like receive that, you know? It, unless I'm, you know, like uh, when it when it comes to like actual writing and words. Um, so it's really a balance between like, giving your audience enough where they can imagine pretty close to what you want them to imagine without giving them a too much that like you're preventing that imaginative process from happening, um, but not too little that there's nothing for them to dig into. Um, like, Framing, like lazy writing is a really interesting way of, uh, of saying this um, because I, I don't think it's so much as lazy as vague that happens a lot. Like I think it's, it's like I, I 
personally feel like I'm much more in danger of becoming like um, too imprecise uh, than lazy. You know, it's like I, I've, I've left too much space for somebody to come up with whatever I want them to imagine on their own. And as a result, they can't, um, they can't like kind of grab a hold onto it or like, you know, kind of um, pick up on the specifics of what I'm trying to get to. Um, whereas like if I, I also don't want to um, like uh, control that imagining so tightly that somebody can't come up with anything on their own or, or imagine it at all on their own. Um, so yeah, it's, I, you know, I, I don't have an answer that's anything like, you know, make sure you give two details, uh, three is too many and one isn't enough. Like there's there, once again, there's not really like a scientific, um, there's not a formula for this, unfortunately, it would be a lot easier if there was. Um, but it's, it's much more of a, like, what can I give somebody that they that their imagination can do the work that I want them to be doing? Um, it's kind of the, the best way I can answer if that. If I can add something uh, process-wise, sure. Um, that's certainly I think you know video game writing gets to benefit from more easily than other forms of writing is uh, like iteration. You know, like. We just talked yeah. about all the iteration that we did in game design and things like that. But yeah, like, absolutely. You can treat your writing the same way and mm -hmm. um, plan your plan your documents in a way that lets you easily do that. Um, so for something like that database yes. of uh, all the items in Maker Mode that we were looking at earlier that had little descriptions for everything, you know, mm -hmm. that was a spreadsheet we had mm -hmm. where yeah. um, it had the the asset names of all the assets that unity would see uh, mm -hmm. natalie could go in and write object names and descriptions and the sub description and uh it was just mm -hmm. one document that was super easy to change and mm -hmm. and put back in the game um every time we made a build essentially mm -hmm. so natalie could play a build and be like you know what i don't really like this one and go edit that really quickly mm -hmm. and the next time the guys built the game that file could was just upload updated and right. we'd see the new work quickly so mm -hmm. there was just tons of on the on the fly iteration so um mm -hmm. i would say find a way to make your documents that you're working in work for you in a way that makes it as easy as possible to just constantly iterate because every time you play test you should Absolutely. also be thinking about all of the writing that's in there and what needs to change because as the game changes like natalie has said those things will change as well uh, so you mm -hmm. need to make it easy on yourself to do that as you go yeah ab absolutely a hundred percent agree but like the fact i've written more in spreadsheets in game writing than like in anywhere else for sure um and that like uh in, in addition to being so super easy to change and like easy to kind of like import and export and move stuff around um it also is so modular right like if i i can just change that one object that's not working or take it out or put in another one or whatever like you know you you don't um you know you don't have to kind of like uh change everything around it necessarily like you can really um you know pick what you want to put in and take out and alter very carefully which you know i think is i think is pretty unique and great too instead of like i've made i'm writing a novel i've changed this one detail at the beginning now i have to do like a continuity edit to make sure that like there's no other places in which i i mention that detail <laughs> like and and i've i've just done this and i know it is a nightmare so uh yeah it's i i have a i have a novel coming out in the fall and uh the editing process is a complete disaster i mean it's it's great i was working with great people but like Having like if I if I say a character's eyes are this color, I have to remember their eyes are that color for the next four hundred pages. <laughs> <laughs> so you can change any detail, but at what cost? Yeah. But at what but cost? But at what cost? <laughs> so this is exactly. a good time to uh, 
I think we're we, we've we've spent our hour. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of your day, Natalie. But uh, can you can you talk about what you're working on? Like, do you want to mention oh, any sure. of your projects yeah, yeah, or yeah, anything I... like that? Or if anyone's interested in stalking you, where can they go and do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, you can find me most places as Natalie Zed. I'm on Twitter um, at uh, Natalie Zed, uh, like Z E D. Um, the novel coming out in the fall is called Hench. It's about uh, hench people, like who work for supervillains, um, and who are who are you know sort of typically considered extremely expendable. Uh, it makes you care about and think about them. It also um, posits that maybe superheroes are bad actually um, for the Earth, especially when it comes to things like insurance claims and you know surviving an encounter with one of them. Um, it also features uh, a, a little bit of body horror and a pretty, pr pretty profound misunderstanding of quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've heard it's also pretty funny. Uh, so it's coming out uh, on William Morrow um, on uh, September 22nd of this year, and we're, uh, we're, it's, it's been a wild and awesome process. So um, yeah, that's it. That's, that's been the thing that's been consuming the vast majority of my time in brain space for like a year of my life um but yeah i'm 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 super pumped that it's going to be out in the world soon and and that it's going to be something that i can like uh finally like show folks we'll be sure to uh tweet about it and stuff um oh that would be great it's available do the mm -hmm. ampli amplification yeah. thing mm -hmm. it will be it will also be a, a via audiobook well, sweet for those who hate to read Very is there anything else you want to plug before we pull the plug? Um, just that uh, I'm also a board member of Dames Making Games, uh, which is a uh, Toronto-based but um, international organization uh, that um, you know is is committed to uh, making like safe spaces for um, game developers from marginalized communities. Um, really, really rad, uh, based in Toronto, and we've recently been moving um, a lot of our programming online. Typically, there's like um, a lot of, we, you know, we run um, many, like often many workshops every single week. Uh, and with the sort of changes to the way that we behave socially, um, you know, we want to we wanted to keep serving our community. So uh, we're doing a lot of uh, a lot of programming online. Um, I'm part of the uh, interactive fiction and games writing um, kind of cohort or like part of the organization. Um, so uh, we are, um, we're doing online writing workshops. Uh, we've tried a couple of them out and there's going to be one uh, next Thursday, um, which is sort of a like co-working writing session that we're going to be trying out. So uh, if you want to go to uh, dmg.to uh, and check out the events, um, you can see some of the really rad events that are going to be taking place online. Amazing. Well, thanks thank everyone you so for joining much. This us. Has been a blast. Thank you, Natalie, for taking the time. And, oh, of course. Uh, any of you who play the game, just know that <laughs> Natalie is the one who wrote all these horrible things that you're reading when you're thank in you. there. <laughs> and it wouldn't be what it is without her. So, from the bottom this is all my thing, really. It's yeah. all my fault. <laughs> Uh, we'll be back again next Friday with another stream. Check us out on Discord. Uh, talk with people there. Talk with us there. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks, everyone.